first thing, go with the railroads. Our first transcontinental railroad. Now this is trivia, but trivia that you need to know. The, the east and the west lines joined at Promontory Point, Utah. It's pretty close to Salt Lake City. Um, at that point, they made the Golden Spike, which, no, the, that is not still there. All right, that should have. But there was a Golden Spike that was symbolic. Um, President Grant, because Grant was at, at president in 1869, he went out to that area and was at that time period. If you ever see the the show Wild West with Will Smith, uh, or was it? Wild Wild West. It kind of, this is where they have some things and they're kind of trying to do that time period in history. Not everything in that movie is exactly true. Um, but that's what they're trying to go back to that time period. Um, but that would be our first transcontinental railroad. Now, where was the first one supposed to be? Yeah, down in the south with the gas and purchase. So kind of making those connections of what would happen. There would eventually be four of them done. Oh, most of the construction done. This is where a lot of our, basically the progress of America was done on the back of immigrants. Um, some of the most dangerous work that was done in building the Transcontinental Railroad <coughs> crossing the, the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada Mountains were done by Chinese immigrants as well as some Irish. Um, that scene that I showed you for From Far and Away at one point earlier in the movie where Tom Cruise is an Irish immigrant, he, um, he is actually working on building the railroads for a short period of, of the time that they're there. Uh, four other lines were built, and you'll see the major lines. There's one more to the north. Here's where the original transcontinental. And there's two more that are a little bit further south because it's easier to get through. The most southern of which would be one that, that the original gas and purchase was supposed to do. Now, that means that not only have we had manifest destiny, but we are connected now transportation-wise. Um, and the amount of time in order to get from one side of the nation to the other has been cut drastically. Now, here's where we get to the boring part, but this is actually the more important part that you would have. The United States was trying to encourage the railroads to be built. So they had this land out west, so what they had were these land grants. And you kind of see here where this is like a checkerboard, and some of the areas, what you, what you would do is, if the railroad built across a stretch of land, the, the United States government said you would get half of that land within so many miles. It might be five miles, it might be 10 miles from that railroad track. So it was just a race if you went and just set down the, the lines. Sometimes depending on what they had, they could plot it out and get certain areas. This is where we would have some things with some of the corruption that we had. Because a lot of times the railroads would come in and they could choose what half of the land that they want, which they of course would take the better land to turn around and sell. Now, the railroad companies, when they got this land, they would want to sell it, and they would sell it at a pretty cheap price. Anyone guess why they sell it at, such, at a cheap price? Wow, it's basically, it's profit. But if they sell it to people for a cheap price, what are those people going to do? They're going to build out there. They're going to farm. How are they going to get the goods that they need where they built out there? The railroad. If they're growing crops, how are they going to get the crops back to the markets back east? The railroad. So the more people that they got to move out there, the more that happened. Um, and here. Again, it helped them for a lot for the settlement of it, but again, we're going to see, and we haven't got to all of the different scandals, but you remember in the Reconstruction, we have the famous scandal of the Credible Blear scandal. Because of different parts that they are doing with the different bribes and trying to get the land, we would have multiple things of fraud in it. And then we have another panic, 1873, the Panic of 1873, so we have an economic recession. The recession comes about because there are too many railroad lines being built. And whenever you have over speculation in something, our last recession we had here in the United States was because of housing, uh, over speculation with that. The 1819 um, panic happened because of speculation in land. All right? This panic happens because of the railroads, which when there's an over speculation of this, you end up with a banking crisis. One thing you'll find that almost every economic crisis we have, it's a, it will then affect the banking 
uh, that they have. Now, before, before they would allow the, the railroads to go out there, they send the Army Corps of Engineers out to survey them. Here is a person you probably won't find in any of our three history books. You won't find him very much. Here, here's a person that I always just, I kind of take my liberty, that I think this is a great American, I'm glad for what he did, and hardly anybody knows anybody about this, but I'm forcing you all to learn about this person. Okay? You want to find him on an AP exam, or the Florida, Florida end of course exam, or anything like that. But for me, this is a person that truly changed America. Because General Henry Washburn went out west, and while he was surveying this land, he had an idea that just was not common for that time period. He went back to Congress and said, let's set aside this land. And people thought he was crazy. What do you mean, set aside this land? Okay. All right? There is areas there that can be used for lumber. There are areas that can be used for farms. There might be, there might be minerals to mine. And after, after he had surveyed this one section, he said, let's just leave it alone. And General Henry Washburn is the reason why we would then have our national parks that were started. And the, for that area that he had, that he saw, was Yellowstone Park. Which means that we now, 130, 40 years later, we can go back and see what General Henry Washburn saw. Again, most people didn't think that way. Um, and that is where, again, it's, so, so there's my little part of a person that I love in history, and I don't know anything else about this man other than that. But it is something that, that he did, and it does change America, because we would add more national parks. And if you go out there today, it is because of his foresight to think. Because again, most people didn't think um, in that way. There's always be more land, is what everybody thought. All right, the other thing is we wanted to get the land there, and this is where we'd have an impact when we'd have immigrant recruitment. And the railroads would not only advertise in the East United States, but they would advertise out over in Europe and try to get European. One area in particular that, that, that did a lot of recruitment was in Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Now, what do a lot of you know about Norway, Sweden, Finland? They're big and strong. Okay, our old Vikings. And here's where you, what? Chocolate? Okay. Uh, you thinking more Belgium? Maybe. Okay. Um, but one thing about it is this is where it's an area that's a bit cold, okay, um, in the Scandinavian area. And so for some of the areas where these railroads were going into, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that was an area that when you, when you talk to someone and tells, tell them that, okay, Minnesota, you got a lot of snow on the ground for for four months of the year. Well, if you're from Norway, oh, only four months? Okay, that's not that bad. What, you mean the snow's melted by May? Okay, I mean, this is where for them, that wasn't that bad. Um, and for those of you that know with different pro, pro teams, what is the nickname of the Minnesota football team? Vikings. The Vikings. The reason being is so many people from Scandinavia moved to Minnesota at that time. Um, I'm gonna tell you, go a little bit about with, uh, with your show and tell soon. And one, and one of the examples I will get, give you, well, actually will go right along this line for that I'm, that I'm going to show you of how, how you're supposed to do your show and tell and what it actually involves um, there. But this is where for other areas. This is also where you can kind of see where the effect of the Industrial Revolution occurs. Germany, Scandinavia, they had the Industrial Revolution occur there. One farmer could, could, could produce a lot more crops. So what happened to those other farm families in Europe? Yeah. Where are they going to go? And that's where a lot of them then came to America. Um, and, that's, and that's what that, that aspect in, in that we have. Uh, we had plenty of land in the railroads. They would sell it to them. All right, the railroad effects, here's some effects on you. Used to be that time was whatever the mayor had. We moved here in Inverness. Dylan's our neighbor, or our mayor, sorry. Uh, he's our mayor. You a morning person, or you like to sleep late? Sleep late. All right, Dylan likes to sleep late, so he sets our town clock, and all the rest of us do it. Well, he likes to sleep late, so he says 8 o'clock is a little bit later. Okay, he sets the town clock, and everybody else, you set your watch. Does it really matter? Because if everybody's going by that clock, it doesn't matter. All right, one person sets a clock, and you're all going by it. 
Let's say you had to go to some place in Ocala. So you get on Old Bessie and you ride your horse to Ocala. How long is it going to take you to take that 30 mile trip on your horse? Two hours. An hour. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. The horse would be moving pretty good if you're even doing that. But you're going to talk about several hours. So if you made an appointment to go over, because you'd have to telegraph to Ocala that you're going to go to something in there, do you actually make it for a certain set time? No. Or do you say afternoon? Afternoon. Sometime afternoon. You're not really worried about. It. So people were not worried about being exact with times. But then the railroad comes along. And they want to set a schedule. And this is where industry changes history. Because they don't want to come where Dylan is a late sleeper and he sets our clock later and then it goes to Ocala and the mayor there sets their clock earlier. They want a standard time. So this is where C.F. Dowd, who in the same history might be more important than General Washburn, um, and is someone that you will see in the history book a lot more, but he comes up with this plan of time zones. So what they did is they said in New York, here's the time. And when the train did it, and when the trains came to all the other areas, they, if there, when, they, when the train came into Inverness, Florida, they said, here's what the time is. Doesn't matter what Mayor Thompson says, it matters what New York City has at that time. And it is standard time that that is made. And then we have our other time zones that are made to adjust for the sun. But this is where you talk about the modernization coming in. We don't even think twice about it today, but that is where that would make change for us. Pullman sleeping, sleeper cars. And here's where, nothing, not a whole lot of details, but most people you rode in cars like this. But if you're taking a trip and you're going across the United States, I know some of you, Taylor, probably on your trip back and forth to Chicago with the band, you're gonna end up in seats like that, sleeping on the floor far, far the way back, on, on back, y'all coming straight through, right? Yeah. So 18 glorious hours. Okay, there. And it's real comfortable to sleep on those Greyhound bus type things, aren't they? It's better than the yellow birds. But this is where for the trains, they started making Pullman sleepers. And what, what you have is, I mean, it's not really much more than bunk beds. But if you're traveling along, isn't that a lot nicer? Yeah. And so this would end up being a new industry that would come in, building these cars. Now, Pullman sleepers are going to become known the um, because we're later on, we're going to have one of the biggest strikes occur during this, during, um, during, with the factory town that makes the pull to sleep. But that is something that can change socially that, that we have with the railroads. All right, going back real quick for the New South. We don't have much for the Southern history of this part, but just a reminder, and this is actually some things from our last section reconstruction. The guy, Henry Grady, wrote and said that the South needed to be self-sufficient. Unfortunately, most of the South is still dependent on cotton. And unfortunately for the South, they have this little bug called a bull weevil that went around and was destroying crops in some areas. Um, but the way that, and, then, and this is where the, and the supply and demand comes in for economics. The South wanted, when the farmer wanted to make more money, they planted more cotton. Unfortunately, so did everybody else. So what happened to the price of cotton? It went down. So the next year, they all planted more cotton. And then what happened to the price? It went down. Meanwhile, in India, in Egypt, they're planting more and more cotton. So the South, that was already in bad shape, is getting worse and worse. Plus, their soil, after decades of depleting, and they're no longer able to move out west, because the area out west is not growing good cotton that you have, because it's too far north that has. Um, so the South is actually getting worse off at this time. Most of the land is still owned by the rich. You remember that, that term, bourbon rule? Okay, rule by, by the richer people. So most of that's still alive out there. And you remember sharecropping, crop lean, and tenant farming. Who controlled everything when it came to any of those systems? Yeah, the rich guy did. So. Sharecropping, a quick, quick re review. The sharecropping is where the landowner owned the land and you would get a piece of the land and they would get a share of your crops, but they got the first share. Um, the tenant farming is where you would rent the land out. The crop lien system was one where you would have to work on that land until you paid off your loan. A lien is a loan. 
And for a lot of lot of blacks, they were they were basically tied to that land, even though slavery was was gone. Now for a man that you hopefully learned about in elementary school, but maybe you didn't. The peanut guy. Yep. George Washington Carver. Now he's a teacher at Tuskegee Institute. That is the, the college that Booker T. Washington started. But what George Washington Carver looked to do, and this kind of filled, filled the vision that, that Booker T. Washington had. Try to find products to make out of crops that grew good in the South. Get away from cotton. Um, one crop that grew really good in the soil that was usually depleted of both, most minerals from cotton was peanuts. Except for how much peanuts can you possibly sell? So George Washington Carver tried to find things that and make them. And, and for most of you, the most famous thing that he invented to make from it would be peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is where George Washington, but he, I mean, there were hundreds of products that he learned to make out of peanuts, um, even clothing out of the peanut vines. Uh, there was a lot of things he learned with corn. Now, this helped not only poor blacks, but poor whites, which was the majority of the people in the South also. So, so that's where you kind of see with, with Carver fulfilling the ideas of Booker T. Washington. All right. Yeah. It says who did that Okay. Four blacks and whites. Which was, I mean, the South at that time, you have a very small upper class, the Bourbons, and then you have a small middle class. So you might have some small independent farmers and some businessmen, and then you had a whole lot of farmers. Uh, there are a whole lot of poorer farmers. Some that were poor, some that were really poor, some that were extremely poor. I mean, this is where, for a lot of people, they didn't realize. Um, yeah, I was watching the other day the, the show about the Mississippi, and one guy said, no one really knew they were poor because everybody else was poor. I mean, it, you didn't realize that, realize that how bad off you were because, hey, everybody else was the same way there in Mississippi. All right, the railroads are selling the lands cheap, so some people moved out there. But here was in my opinion, the greatest welfare act in the history of the United States. We're going to give away the land for free. Now, is anything ever truly for free? Now, what is called a quarter section? Anyone know why 160 acres is called a quarter section? Is it 640 is it? Whole section? Is that a full square mile? Square mile. It's a square mile. Okay. Some of you might notice this looks sort of familiar. Remember the land ordinance of 1785 that surveyed the land in the Midwest? Well, we continued the same thing of building townships, which would be a lot of times, and sometimes we make them bigger, but they are still going by the standard six miles by six miles. And then you would have 36 square miles <coughs> in there. And each of those would be a section. So then you would divide the section up into 160 acres, which is a quarter section. Now, for the Homestead Act, there were three major things you had to do in order to get this land for free. Uh, well, first of all, before you did the paperwork, you would actually go to, to the office, fill out paperwork, and where you claim that land if no one had it. Then you had to go and build a house. Now, I can't remember the exact size of the house, but for some reason or other, I think it had to be at least 10 foot by 12 foot. It might be 10 by 10, it might be 12 by 12 foot. That's not very big at all. Most of your bedrooms are bigger than that. <laughs> if we were to kind of look at it, you had to build a house basically at least this big. Wow. Now, what is a house? A bed. A place where you live. One room. Well, it could be a one room house, but what? You got a roof? You gotta have a roof, plumbing, walls, a door. No, you don't have, have plumbing. <laughs> they don't that could be outside. That's a hole, hole in the ground, an outhouse. A door, an entrance. You sort of could have a window, although some of them didn't even have a window. You usually need some sort of entrance. So it's pretty loose definition of what a house is. There. So you didn't have to have it very big, but you had to have you had to build the house. Second thing is, of that 160 acres, you had to farm at least 10 acres. Is that really a big deal? No. Because what did most people do for a living? Farm. Farm. So that part really was pretty easy. Now the first year of farming wasn't real good, but then that second year after that the roots had finally brought it through. The third thing is you had to live there for five years. 
And after that five years, that land was yours. And technically, you didn't even have to live there all five years. You had to live there at least half the year for five straight years. So if you wanted to, and you really didn't want to be somewhere up there in upstate Minnesota or North Dakota or South Dakota during the really nasty winter months, going back to St. Paul, Minnesota or Chicago, go there, they're there for four or five months during the winter, and then you go back during the, during the spring and stay there through fall and late. So you didn't actually have to stay on your homestead all year round. Well, how could you stay there if you wanted to have a vacation back to People can live in smaller than that even. It's amazing what people can live in. Again, we're a very spoiled society. But how's that for a welfare program? You want to start a new life? Here you go. Fill out some paperwork, build some sort of house, and you're going to see with some of the houses that they build, and with, with sod houses and dugouts, they're not very hard to build. Um, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Remember that Turner's thesis and that idea, the rugged individualism. Um, another thing that was passed at this time would be the Timber Culture Act. Very similar to the Homestead Act, except for if you got the, home, the Timber Culture Act, instead of farming 10 acres, you had to plant and then maintain 40 acres of trees. Now, anybody guess of why we were trying to plant trees in the Great Plains? Because we're coming down. Soil erosion. Well, it wasn't erosion at that time, although that would be a reason later on we'd have it. We don't have them cut down because they don't grow there naturally, except for cottonwood along some of the rivers. Well, we were going to actually try to change the landscape. Remember, it was the Great American Desert? So we're going to make it where it's a forest. Great American Forest. How do you think these little saplings did when they went? And if you've ever been out west, I'm so I have family in, in Kansas. Dylan, don't you have family in Nebraska? Mm -hmm. You ever get out there in Great Plains and when the wind's blowing? It's just the thing is, is it just, it's always blowing. It's either hot or it's cold. There's no nice breeze if you're ever out in the Great Plains. It just seems, I mean, it's either uh, just, I mean, it's almost like a blow dryer on you when it's hot or it's just cold. All right, I mean, and with those, I mean, the, a lot of the trees we tried planting didn't, didn't grow and work. Although there are patches of it in different areas that you can kind of see. But that was part of where we tried to change the environment. And some things just aren't going to go. We can't make the Great Plains, which were naturally a grassland, and make it into a forest. Okay, it just did not happen. Um, all right, here are some of the houses that you could build. Now, for those of you that don't know, Here's for a sod house. What is a sod house made out of? Grass. Yeah, sod or grass. Which what you would do is you would take your plow, that John Deere plow, plow strip. The roots are so thick in there, and any of you that, that have ever dealt with sod, I mean, it's there. these roots would be really thick together. And you stack up the sod. Look at this beautiful sod house. <laughs> Kaylee, is that a place you, where you want to live? Oh, yeah. Now, notice there is no window there. Because if you didn't have the money to build a regular house, the hardest thing you would have is to try to figure out how to build a roof. Because you need to get some sort of wood for the frame. So hopefully maybe there was a river nearby that you could find enough cottonwood that you could get and build some sort of roof. The other thing was to build a door. But you really don't even have to build a door because there's enough buffalo skins around. Can't you just put one of those on the door? Kind of build a little frame to make sure the dirt doesn't come. Can you all imagine cleaning a sod house? Your walls are dirt. Your floor is dirt. Okay, you might have a dirt roof. Okay, you think there might be a few critters living in your in your house. That's funny. All right, a dugout. Anyone know what a dugout is? They literally just dig a cave out of a hill. Yeah, you see right here. This is a dugout. Instead of having to build all the walls with it, well, you just basically dig a cave, and all you got to do is build one wall. That's pretty You're awesome. living in a hole in the side of, the, of a hill. That's awesome. Is what a dugout was. Cool. Is that a house? Yeah, fit the, the def definition. Um, <laughs> one thing about the Great Plains, and this is what you see over there, the isolation that you would have. Now, a lot of men would go out and live on their own, but a lot of times there would be families that come out. And for a woman, you go out into the middle of the, top of the Great Plains. 
And if let's say just half the people around were just single men, but when you were there, 160 acres of land, so you kind of look at it in a square mile, if all the sections are filled, you've got four possible families. Except for, are all the sections filled? No. No. The, your nearest neighbor might be two, three miles away. You might live four or five miles away from the town. If you live four or five miles away from the town where the railroad goes, how often do you go into town? No. Never. So that is where, I mean, for what, and usually when something had, when you had to go and get some supplies, did the woman usually go in with the husband to get things? No. No, she stayed home. Well, so the husband's actually getting a little more social interaction. Um, and some of the stories you have, I mean, women basically going crazy. All right, men also out there with the isolation, but, but it was even more so for, for women. Also made it known that they were pretty tough women if they could go out there. And the West actually rewarded them. Because long before the 19th Amendment would ever be passed, there were states that started to allow women to vote. Wyoming is our very first state that said, if you're a woman, you can live out here. You got the right to vote just like a man. And this is where some of that <laughs> equality that you would, would see is where it comes. Um, I have a picture of a windmill. Why is a windmill really important out west? Because it's windy. Water. Climb which way the wind's blowing. Well, it is the water. Because you would, you would get a pipe going down there. The wind's blowing constantly. And if you are on the Great Plains, you, have, you get the water. And instead of having to try to I mean, you think of a bucket, but it fits down too far. But the wind just constantly gets it gets the water flowing. And you have, like right here, you can see there's a tank off to the side. So it keeps filling up that tank with water. So you constantly have the water um, that, you, that you would need. All right, some things, and these are things that we've had before, but here's where you kind of, kind of see with the ag agriculture. John Deere, no, he didn't invent the plow. It is the steel plow. How does that change history? So it's sharper, lighter, yeah. better, 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 more reliable. Because yeah. this is a plow that could get through the grasses and the roots on the Great Plains. The older plows couldn't. So before, in the 1830s and 40s, they, when they were traveling on the Oregon Trail, they are traveling on that, but they, they would not have been able to farm it. Now, John Deere makes it where they are. Cyrus McCormick makes this reaper. And with the reaper, and here we go, kind of uh, have some pictures. The old saw that you'd have to go and swing this to cut it. Some of the original reapers that you would have. Now today, this is a combine. And this is on the front of it, which is the same basic design that McCormick had with the same going through and cutting it. Saving a lot more um, labor when you're doing this. We'd have a cedar. What is a cedar? How does that save time? You don't have to put it in the ground. Water. Yeah, think about it. Instead of going by taking a stick, putting a seed, you have a machine that it falls in, and basically you have, if you ever go through a cornfield, okay, and the corn is exactly so many inches apart, okay, they have a cedar that puts it down that way. Are you wasting seeds? No. And no. that's where you have those. Um, with a thresher, besides having the reaper, the part that the thresher would have is that you would have a machine that would take the grain from inside the husk. What you would do otherwise is in the winter, where you brought in the 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 grain, you would would it dried out a little bit. You go in and you would take sticks and you basically beat it and then blow off the other part. Now the reason why this is called a combine is this combines a reaper and a thresher together. And steam engines, some of the things that needed to be done could be done by a steam engine, not just the, the railroads. But railroads would be important. Now I'm getting out of kind of uh, farm equipment, but put stars, arrows by this. This is something that is actually one of the most important things in American history that gets forgotten about. Rule free delivery. What does rule mean? Farm. Farm or country. What does free mean? Free. What does that mean? No, you don't have to pay. What is delivery? Give it to you. To bring it to you. So, anybody have a guess of what rule free delivery is? Bring you your farm. For free. 
for free. They'll deliver it for free. You still have to buy the items. But this is where we would have a change in America. And you see here, RFD. This is where our post office, part of the U.S. postal system, would have it where you could get things delivered for free. So if you did go out into the homestead, homestead and you moved out to the middle of South Dakota, you could get order something from Marshall Fields in Chicago. What would you order things? And what you could order with things was from catalogs. The most famous was Sears. And I'll probably show you a film um, about, about with Sears. Where he started, he was actually a telegraph operator, and he found a way to buy a whole bunch of uh, pocket watches and decided, let me try this out. And he puts out an order for anybody else that wants to buy these pocket watches where he bought them in bulk, got them real cheap, and then he sold them and was able to sell them and made a profit on each one. And he started doing that, and he started Sears and Robot. Montgomery Ward would do the same thing. And what they would have is with these catalogs. And you could buy practically anything out of this. And, if we, and, I'll, and I'll try to find some of the things from the catalogs. But when I say practically anything, I mean practically anything. You want to buy a gun, you can buy it from a Sears catalog. I have a Sears shotgun. Okay, Sears made shotgun. You wanted to buy a house, you can buy a house from Sears. What it was is they had the pre-made, all the stuff cut, and basically it was a ready-to-made house. They send you, and basically you would have stuff coming on the train and the parts for the house. It's actually one of the things, be the few houses that are still around that were the, the Sears and Roebuck houses. You wanted some drugs? You could buy drugs. <laughs> because at that time, there was, the re, there was not the regulation that we had. So you wanted a little morphine to help, you, help with your aches and pains? Okay, just order some from Sears and Robot, and the trains would bring it to your town and take it to your little to your little house out in the middle of nowhere. And morphine. Yes, and a lot of people were addicted to morphine because they had got it during the Civil War. And this is actually where we're going to find, like we talk about post-traumatic stress today, we had things like that happening after the Civil War, and we had people that got addicted to painkillers after the Civil War also. Um, all right, environmental effects. Uh, 1880 to 1920, the population Tornado Alley, which is the area in the middle of the West, would increase sixfold. That time period was really good for agriculture. Believe it or not, we have climate change. Now, climate change happens naturally. Whether or not man affects it, I'll let you all decide that for your, yourself on uh, there. But we do have over time. Well, we had a period of a lot of wet years. But then we went through a period of a lot of dry years. And what we ended up having was one of the biggest environmental disasters. When we get to 1920, as you'll see this. All that farming that we did with the land. And you see these pictures on this? Yeah. That's not smoke. That's dust. That's crazy. And we would have dust storms. And in the 1920s, when we would have the dust bowl come at that time, because of dust that went through the Great Plains, where we plowed some areas that maybe shouldn't have been plowed, and we and one of the ways that you would do for moisture would actually to plow. I'll get to that in a second. But what would happen was we'd have these dust storms. There was actually blocking the sun in New York City with some of these storms that got the wind blew us so far. And it and it is one of the worst disasters I've had. Today we have learned our, some areas that okay, you just don't farm this. Um, there are some times that you don't plow, plow things. And if you have, have ever been near a field that's been recently plowed and it's real hot. Um, uh, but then you actually, one of the things you would do, if you, if you ever, you know if you ever dig soil that's a little moist down there? So if you plow a field, it actually brings up moisture for a short time. But what happens when that moisture dries out? It makes it worse. So that's where you have that. All right, we're going to go ahead and stop that part. That made it where we could farm out in the the western area would ultimately make for, for what would be the Dust Bowl. And I'm kind of connecting for something in, in the future. But even though we look at things and we were developing this, all these great things that we did agriculturally, we were destroying the environment. And we would have to go and completely redo things. Uh, it's read an article recently about how in Oklahoma and Kansas, where these are two of our reddest states when it comes from voting and Republicans and don't want the federal government in, but when the Dust Bowl hit, they were the one place that came in and asked Franklin Roosevelt during the Great Depression come in, and the government came in and, and 
told in some areas wouldn't allow farmers to farm. Um, did things to make sure that we did not have as much erosion and the wind going over it. And it's one of the cases that you kind of look at that big government was good. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But that's where for the, the dust bowl has. All right, other agricultural information. During the Civil War, we had the first of the, of the Morrell Land Grant Acts passed. We would have multiple ones passed over time. When you see Land Grant Act, think colleges. Now, overall agricultural colleges, but not always agricultural colleges. If Mikey is a farmer, who is he going to learn how to farm from? His parents. His parents. But what if his dad's a bad farmer? What's he going to learn? Bad farming. Bad habits. Bad farming. And he'll pass it down to his son. And what is his son going to learn? And what ends up happening, and this is where for the Republicans, and you can kind of see a little Henry Clay popping up in here, the idea of let's make some progress. Well, one way that you can make better things for the future is to change, and you get people educated. And so what they set aside was land that would then be used for colleges. A lot of these then became agricultural schools. And the state of Florida, University of Florida, and Florida A&M were both land-grant colleges. Um, University of Florida is one of the best agricultural schools in America. Um, in the southeast, it's, it's probably, except for maybe Arkansas and Auburn, might be the only ones that rival it um, when it comes for an agricultural school. Reason why it is in Gainesville, because originally the University of Florida was, I can't remember if it was in Ocala, then Lake City, or Lake City, then Ocala, but then when they got the land from, from the Morrell Land Grant Act is when they moved to Gainesville. And this is why if you are at University of Florida, you have all these things and you have cow pastures basically on the middle of campus. So you, you have these dorms and then you have some pastures and then you have Shands Hospital. Okay, because it is still, it's also at a very large campus where I went to Florida State, and in 15 minutes, you can do a light jog and get from one corner to the other at Florida State. If you're on a bike at University of Florida, you may not be able to cross it in 15 minutes because it's a lot bigger, and again, the agriculture background. Uh, meanwhile, because of the segregation, here's where I say for connecting things. In Florida, we would have a white college with the University of Florida, and then we'd have the black college with Florida A&M. And so that's where Florida A&M was also given land in the agricultural side. What is A&M? Agricultural and mechanical. So um, sometimes, sometimes some schools are A&M would be agricultural and mining, depending on. But for Florida A&M, it's agriculture and mining and um, mechanical, which would be the engineering side then of it. Um, if you have A and T, you'll see some place to so then agriculture and technology. All right, but Danza Farms. These are basically corporate farms. Ended up not seceding overall. Corporations were really growing in the late 1800s. This is where we get to the Rockefeller and the um, and Carnegie. Um, and the, and so some of you try with that the agriculture. The problem that you had though, and you notice here, dropping grain prices. Same thing that was happening with the South with cotton. As we planted more and more wheat and corn, what happened to the price of wheat and corn? It went down. And unfortunately, what did most farmers end up doing? They planted more, which caused the prices to do what? Go down more, because you kept increasing the supply. Um, there. Demand didn't go up enough to meet where the supply. And all these agricultural advances were making it where we were growing more. And for the corporations, then they were a lot of them ended up going under um, during that time. And if those of you that know that the for the 1950s, one of the biggest TV shows was Bonanza. Um, and it is, even though it's named after this, that was supposed to be a family family ranch and all that was at that time. All right, cooperatives. Uh, put stars by this or something. This is a little bit of a part that is, um, it's kind of thrown in here, but it is something that in America that did make a big difference. We're going to find here in the next section that farmers had a major problem with the railroad companies. They, what they would do is if you moved out to the middle of South Dakota and you were a farmer, you're growing wheat, 
you are dependent on the railroad to take your wheat back east. And so they were controlling, so they, so you had to, to sell it at that time. And sometimes the farmers figured out a way to join together in a cooperative, think working together cooperative or collectively here. And they would then have their, their price and they wait till the price comes up. Now in order to do that, and if you've ever been out to Nebraska, Kansas, we have our cathedrals out in the middle of the Great Plains. Some of these are huge. Um, there, the Kansas Cathedral is a grain elevator. And what the farmers were, they may not be able to make, and these are like giant silos, they may not be able to put big ones on their own farm, but they could as a town put, come together. And then they make these giant grain elevators. And while the price was low, they would store the, store the seed. And then when the price went up, then, that, then they would sell it collectively. Plus they could go and they could buy things together. Because if you go, if you are a company, one reason why you're able to buy for lower prices, if you're going to buy a thousand of something, you can get it at a lower price than if you were to go and buy just two of them. So the farmers together, if there's a bunch of things to need, they would buy in bulk. And I have on here, and this is where I want you to, to realize this, it's much like a union. Because the farmers, even though farmers, I mean, this is one of the truest American being your own boss is being a farmer, but they join together and they are collective. Now, let's do that, before I use that word collective, that'll be used later on for the communists. And in the, in the Soviet Union, we will have collective farms. But the big difference between the United States and what happened in the communist nations, where each of our farmers were still individuals, but then they sold their, or they put their crops in together. The Soviet Union, the government came in and took away the family farms and then all the farmers would be living almost like a big apartment building and all their land would then be farmed collectively together, which you took away the individualism because you still, as a farmer, you make the, the more you did and the better that you did is how you got paid. Once you get to the Soviet Union, it's all there together. So if some people are slacking, well, they could get away with a lot more. All right, number one problem. Here's where we get to the really exciting stuff for things, but here's the fact. Farmers, number one problem are the railroads. Why are the choo-choo trains bad for farmers? Well, doesn't really take away their land. All right, what cost? Shipping, that's the thing, the cost of shipping, freight charges. Overall, the price of freight was going down because there was so much competition where all these railroad tracks were being built. But if you are in a small town and there's only one set of tracks coming in and out of your, of your town, is there any competition? Do you have any choice but to pay whatever price they demand? And here's where, let's say that, and we actually had some things in the south here, but we're in Inverness, and you're a farmer here in Inverness and you're growing something, it might cost you more money to get get your stuff from Inverness to Gainesville than it costs to get from Gainesville to New York City. Because maybe once you got to Gainesville, there were a whole bunch of different railroad lines competing with each other. But you wouldn't be able to bring all of your products to Gainesville, at least not economically. So whoever owned that railroad line from Inverness to Gainesville basically has you where you have to go by their price. And for farmers, they, this is one that one thing that really was hurting them among others. This is where the shipping or the freight charges um, that they would have. Um, remember where I, where I said for the, the town that was known for the slaughterhouses, what, what city became the slaughterhouse? Chicago. Minneapolis, St. Paul happened to end up being like the center for grain. So all of those, so this is where railroad lines, we ended up with a lot of the processing of the plants going, going there to Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, but you have. Here's your major Supreme Court case, one of your top ten that you have to know. Munn versus Illinois. And this is sometimes called a Granger case. We're going to have Grange in here. The Supreme Court said the states could regulate business. This is big government. Here's where we, this is an argument that we constantly have. Alexander Hamilton would have been smiling for Munn versus Illinois. Henry Clay would be smiling with Munn versus Illinois. 
because these are people that said that the federal government should be able to come in and put their, their hand in and regulate it. Now, I have this question on, on here that how does this affect you today? Not many of you in here are farmers. Anybody here a farmer? Okay, Dylan, you're a farmer. So you're worried about shipping rates today? So, but it does affect every single one of you in here today. Anybody here use electricity in their house? Now, do you have to have electricity in today's society? Yeah, realistically. Yes, it is. yes, there are lakes that you can go up. But for the most part, you have to have it. Do you have a choice of what electric, electric company to go with? No. No, you don't. More than likely, you don't. There's probably only one company that has the electric lines going down your street. And for your case, it'll either be Sumter Electric with the Kutri Electric or Progress Energy, which is now Dick. Seco now. Okay, so, all right, Seco is Sumter Electric. Oh. Okay, so, and as I believe those are the only three that, it, unless you happen to be in a place where two of them come together, and that is in very, very rare situations, because those companies don't want to have power lines down the same place that another place has power lines, because if they don't have all the customers, it's not worth their money putting the power lines. So if you do have Seco or Sumter Electric, if they decided we're going to raise up your electric rates by 30% per, per kilowatt, what do you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, all right, you can complain about it, but <laughs> you might decide, okay, I'm going to disconnect off of this. And unless you're going to have your own generator or solar power or something like that, you're stuck. Mud versus Illinois has it where if there is something that is essential for business or your life, those electric companies are allowed to have a profit, but in order to have that profit, they can't make an excessive profit off you. So if Seco or Progress Energy or one of those companies decides to raise up your electric rates, they have to go to the state of Florida in front of the Utilities Commission and say, we're going to raise it up such and such amount per kilowatt. Here's the reason why. Um, after our hurricanes in 2004, they had to raise it up quite a bit. One reason was that they had used up all of their money because they have to have a certain money set aside when there is a giant storm because they have to spend a whole lot of money. Right now up in New York and New Jersey, there are other electric companies that are in there that those electric companies are having to pay them to take care of the problem. So they've had their, their savings for basically a rainy day savings. Well, 2004 in Florida, we had four hurricanes hit in one year. Do you think those electric companies used up their emergency money real fast? Yeah. Not only that, they also store up extra equipment. How many transformers do you think got destroyed with four hurricanes hitting Florida in that year? So all their extra transformers were gone. Same thing's happening right now up in New York and New Jersey. One reason why some of the places can't get their power on yet is they, they might have everything set up and they don't have transformers because transformers that blew. Whichever round of a blown transformer, that's a neat thing to see. It's like a nice little fireworks to see. But that's not a good thing if that's then leading to your house. Um, but this is where Munn versus Illinois does affect you. And where I've kind of said like top 10, top 12 cases to know, this is so one of those. Right? Yes, crazy. right. They, they, can't, they can't decide we're doubling your electric this month. They, in order for them to go up higher, they have to go in front of the commission and say, here's what. Get it. They are allowed to make a profit, they just can't make an, assess, an excessive profit. Because realistically, your power company has a monopoly on whatever street you're on or wherever you're at. And this is where, if they're, and we, sometimes you have to allow it because it would not make economical sense to have three sets of power lines and you get to choose from it. People used to yell the same thing about cable TV, except for do you have to use cable TV? No, no. Okay, you can use, you can use a satellite TV. You can actually we have free TV. You don't even have to do that. So that's why for cable, it's a little bit, little bit different. Free TV? Free TV? You can you can do a cable. No, you don't have to. You there are there are channels. You don't get many channels here in Citrus County. I think you can get about three. Oh. Okay, but if you live in a metropolitan area, there's a few more places that you can get. Um, but but yeah, here here we don't have a whole lot because we're in a place where we're actually we have a lot of metropolitan areas around us, but we're just outside the range of those. So except for like the strongest stations in Tampa or Orlando, we don't get those. 
Um, if we were probably 30 miles closer, you'd get a whole bunch of the Tampa station or a whole bunch of the Orlando If you're in between the two, you could get all of them uh, there, but, but we don't have it where it goes long range. Problem number two, the banks. Farmers would have to take out a loan a lot of times in the spring to buy what they needed to go get through the harvest. And banks would sometimes charge an extremely high interest rate. When you take out a loan, that's how banks make money. Uh, there's nothing illegal about it that you, there. But if you charge higher, they knew the farmers had no choice if they, because you, you can't plant the crops unless you were able to get a loan to buy the seeds, especially if the year before was bad. But what would end up happening is, as they're growing the crops and they're thinking, okay, when I harvest this, my corn is going to be selling for $25 a bushel. And then they're watching, and their corn isn't ripe yet, but, that, but because more people plant it and the price is going down, it goes from $20 a bushel, $18 a bushel, $17 a bushel. Meanwhile, the, the banks make lower interest rates. No. So the farmers are looking at things and they're saying, all right, I still got to pay all this back. So they did not like the idea of this. Farmers like inflation. Now, most of the time when you hear inflation, inflation is bad. Inflation overall, for Americans, we like inflation as long as it's small inflation. If we know the prices are going to be going up, but a little bit at a time, that is a good thing. Most Americans own homes. You want the price of your value of your home to be going up as you own it. And as you are, as the price goes up and you're paying off your mortgage, then you are actually paying for what you bought the house at a certain time. Well, the farmers, they wanted inflation, except for they wanted if it was excessive inflation, that would be good for them. Because if inflation went 10, 15 percent, the prices are raising up dramatically, then that would mean the prices for their crops they're selling are going to rise up dramatically, but that their loan change. So it made it easier for paying off loans. If you have a lot of debt, inflation is good. Now, people that have a lot of money usually don't have a whole lot of debt. So the people that have a whole lot of money, do they want high inflation? So that's where the richer people, you don't want inflation. Yeah. There. Why is inflation good for people with debt? Because, as, because what, usually with inflation, prices of everything go up, including with farmers, the crops you're going to sell. Oh, so now, what will happen with you? If we have, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm definitely not one person saying we need to have excessive um, Inflation, but let's say for some of you, you're going to go to college. You're going to have to get college loans, and if we have, you get your loans at whatever. Then for the next couple of years, what the what the price is for your college and, and it stays. But if after you graduate, you get a job, and during that time we have really high inflation. Now the price of everything is going up, but what happens to your wages? They usually go up. Now the thing is, wages lag behind the price of things. As the price of things go up. Wages will, but it's it's usually several months or years behind. But as you had your college loans, if if in 2020 the value of the dollar um, is like where what was a dollar what was worth a dollar in 2010 is now costing two dollars in 2020. But your loans that you have during that time, it's easier to pay it off. Am I losing some of y'all? This is where the economics comes in with with the dollars and things. Yes. Why does um why is like something that would cost like a dollar now would cost less in a previous time? Why does that happen? Then it's, it's, it's because, because of inflation. Of yeah. The and so I'm right, and now we no longer print money. We just what we've had in the last five years, we've had was quantitative easy. We now just the Federal Reserve says poof, magically there's more money. We don't actually have to print it anymore. We just say it's there and it's there. Uh, which does help out. All right, I don't think of that deep in yeah, here. Uh, but it's the same thing as it used to be for our things. What are you doing here? You gonna give us a PowerPoint then on inflation? Yeah. 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 He's going to be jeweled. What? Jeweled. Inflation. That'll be a good topic. Then. Yeah, and this is Chris has given an example. One of the things that Germany did in between World War One and World War Two, they had the inflation and they just printed up more money 
And so people were literally bringing wheelbarrows to buy bread. Uh, sometimes the bucket that they carried the money in was worth more than the money. Some of you that have taken a trip to Mexico and you go to buy your sombrero and they say, oh, it costs 7,000 pesos. And you're like, 7,000 pesos? And you're thinking dollar. Well, how much is that American money? Oh, nine dollars. You go to Sweden. Okay. So this is where, where you do the inflation that you have. All right, again, try not to get too far off topic here, but all right, greenback party. When you see greenbacks, greenbacks are dollars. Paper money. I think before I've gone over about what money is worth, your trust in the government. Well, they wanted more paper money. What did the bankers want money to be backed by? Gold. Now, then we would also have some people that wanted to buy gold and silver. Remember that Comstock load and silver? But a lot of the bankers were afraid they didn't trust silver enough. So, that, But that's where we would end up having bimetallism and the party that we're going to have later on, the People's Party or Populist Party, that would be a main, one of the main planks in their platform. Yeah. Why did people ever want, if everything we used to do was in like gold and silver, right? so why did we ever start printing paper money? The, the main reason was actually comes to the Great Depression. We it helps to get when we got off the gold standard. Um, that really didn't go, but we got off gold and silver standard. That helped us get out of the Great Depression. Again, we kind of inflated. We magically say there's more money, um, and you can only do that to a certain extent until people no longer trust what happened. Which is why in this last election we actually had Ron Paul. Uh, who's a Republican candidate that was saying we need to go back to the gold standard, uh, which might be a little bit too extreme uh, that we have, but what's called fiat money <laughs> in there, which is your trust in government. Oh. Every civilization that's had it has it worked, but every civilization ends up somewhere dying down, somewhere taking over it, so you can oh, give any reason. Yeah. Um, like, if you felt that the American dollar was going to be kind of useless, like let's invest in more gold. Yeah, you would buy more gold. And one reason why the price of gold has gone up so much over the last couple of years has been the fact that not only the United States, but other countries have inflated their dollars uh, that, that they have had. Um, now, like if there was going to be a little great depression, would you buy more gold? Well, you should have hopefully bought it five years ago. Now, now might be a little bit too late. Although, if you really are one that thinks that thinks that's going to get worse, then gold's still a good investment. So. All right, Tyler. So what was the reason that they liked inflation? It's easier for them to pay off their debts. Okay. All right, farmers, they are having a problem with their farms being foreclosed, but if they had inflation, then their debt, then their 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 debts were less. Why is there a price of gold? Was gold supposed to be like the worth of money? Like well, and this is where when there is more inflation, if there's going to be inflation, gold will will go up, and as people don't have trust in things, the the price so. So that's why, as we, if you print more paper money, then it, then each little bit of gold that you have, the gold doesn't amount of gold doesn't change. You can't magically say, "Poof, there's more gold." Yeah. Now you could have it where more, more gold is discovered, and then if you actually, let's say, we have South Africa finds a, a huge, huge, huge amount of gold, it actually brings the price of gold down because it's no longer as as rare. So, uh, someone else had a question. Um, I don't is there like a middle ground between inflation and deflation? And that's what you try to get. That's the reason why we have the Federal Reserve. Because you don't want deflation. And the only time we've had deflation for a large amount of time was the Great Depression. And that was a very depressing time for us. So, so you don't want the what you what you want, a good economy, you have between three and five percent inflation. How do you keep it exactly on that? That's what the Federal Reserve gas, tries to do. Was so gas inflated, or is that just? Well, one reason why, even though we have the supply of gas going up, one reason why the price of gas has not gone down like it should the last couple of years is because we have had that quantitative easing, and the price of oil is connected directly with the American dollar. So as we weaken the American dollar, the price of gas goes up. All right, we got to get on with this part and finish it here because this is more exciting. The Grange Movement. What, why is deflation bad? We'll do it another time. Okay. <laughs> um, see, this is where economics is not always boring. Okay, and it's, it's something. And some of you really, I mean, you might understand this, and that's why for your senior year, economics is a tough class. But some of you will be an easy class. When you see grains, what should you be thinking? Farmers, farmers. Now, Oliver Kelly is the founder of it. Look at that great beard. 
Okay, the beard without the mustache. All right, there's a style for you. Um, the official name of it was the Patrons of Husbandry. Husbandry is the breeding of animals. He founded it. It starts out as a social organization, but as these farmers are getting together, then we end up having it where they start addressing their problems. Now, I hate to say we're all saying through connections. Around the same time period, we had another social organization called the KKK that established. They went a little bit different direction than the Grange of how to go after what they consider their problems. Um, but what they ended up having is we have our Granger laws. And when you see that with the cases, the Munn, Munn versus Illinois was one. Now, the first one that comes through, and notice I have this a little bit smaller. It's not as important as Munn versus Illinois, if you can just remember it as a Granger case. But Wabash versus Illinois. And again, Alexander Hamilton would be really happy because it said the states could not regulate interstate commerce. But right after that comes Munn versus Illinois, which says the federal government could. So now the US government can come in and tell you can't make shipping rates too high. We're going to, when we get to the business side, we're going to go into it, but that would lead to the Interstate Commerce Act. What does interstate mean? Interstate. Within two states. No. No, within two states. Like two or more. Okay, intra is within. All right, inter is two or more. So two or more states, what's commerce? Trade. Trade. All right, act is a law. All right, and it said the US government. So basically the US government is in charge of interstate commerce. The Grange still start those cooperatives. These farmers that had the same problems, well they started working together in the cooperatives that I talked about. And we would have the Grange in nearby Ocala. And this is where it's not just Western farmers, it was Southern farmers that were involved. And, at, and, and on with this, and this is one thing the Florida End of Course exam actually ha will have a lot of questions about because something that normally is seen as a Western problem was something that was here in Florida. They would establish what was called the Ocala Platform, which led to a lot of different things and ideas. And at that time, the Republicans and Democrats, they said, oh, that's a stupid idea, we'll never do it. But over the next 10 years, these ideas become more and more popular. And then when we get to the progressive era, we will end up having an amendment that makes the income tax legal. We'd have the direct election of senators. We will then have lower tariffs. We'd establish the Federal Reserve. So these farmers, the ideas that they have in Ocala in 1890 would end up being what would be the changes that we'd have in history later on. Grange would eventually emerge into the Populist or People's Party. It's a mixture of farmers from both the West and the South. Anyone have a guess? I say any, so say anyone see an issue that will split the culture? Any guess of what would kind of divide the farmers in the West and their their problem? They have a lot of same problems with the farmers in the South. But what issue do you think will do it? Not in the answer. Slaves are gone. What is it? Segregation. segregation. Remember, this is why I said you have to know the difference between segregation and slavery. Because farmers out west are saying, wait a minute, this is wrong for your issue of segregation. So even though they had a lot of problems, that kind of made Even sometimes you would end up having factory workers in the east that have some of the same problems. They also included women. Oh, God forbid, right? But this is where Mary Lease, not just Oliver Kelly, uh, Mary Lease. And I know for some of you this is where it has a lot of things. And again, the biggest thing that this would be would be the impact of the future. The one man, though, that you have, though, is with this election will be William Jennings Bryan. He would be the candidate for the Populist Party, which would have so much that they would actually join together with the Democrat Party. And that is known as fusion. They come together. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this election also, because William James Bryan is just an incredible man and huge differences that, that were made uh, at, at, during that time period. Uh, and I'll come back to Marcus Hanna also and the Front Forge campaign. But this way, the main issue that he has is bimetallism. What is bimetallism? That's like gold and silver. Yeah, silver and gold, silver and gold for things. <laughs> Cross the gold speech, remember from our bracketing dates, which I was, I think I have a, a copy of it there. McKinley ends up winning it, and when you see gold bugs, 
That's where the people that supported the goal were the ones that, that win that too. And you see with the campaign, the red at that time is the people and the Democrats. Okay, I know this is confusing where today we use that for red, but you notice it is the west and the south kind of together against the north, and then California is like the north. Anyone know what their Wizard of Oz is actually about money? Yes, yes. yes. The monkeys are the one people and... Wow. <laughs> oh, the one people are.